Welcome to this webinar organized by the Information and Data Management Committee of Practice of the CGR Platform for Big Data and Agriculture. I'm Celine Nober, I'm the Communication Coordinator of the COP and I will facilitate the webinar. Today we'll talk about the challenges faced when working with qualitative data. This webinar was organized thanks to Bosun who raised the fact that this is currently a, a burning topic for him and that it might also concern other colleagues. So we have gathered researcher working with qualitative data to hear their challenges and how they handle them. Now let me introduce you to Olatun Bosun Obileye, the Institutional Data Manager at IITA. He leads the team responsible for data management plans, preservation, curation, and data governance, open access, open data, and research data repository management. He serves as the big data platform focal point for IITA and is the member of the IITA's Digital Delivery Working Group. Over to you, Boson. Thank you, Celine. We didn't want CG in our various centers. We commonly deal with both qualitative and quantitative data. However, it seems qualitative data is less represented in our daily discussions, especially within our COP. Of recent gender-related projects, is coming to the forefront, and most of these are qualitative related research data. The concern is who is responsible for this data? Do we have a means of preserving this data? Is there any institutional policy guiding the reuse? How are we sure that what we are doing is the right thing? And this makes us to come up with the topic that how do we handle the challenges of managing qualitative data? We are taking stories from the trenches. I hope we will be able to get some insight as we go into this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Vosun, for the introduction. I will now have three presentations that will give us an overview of the qualitative data cycle through its different users. We'll start with Gondola Fisher that will give us a, the perspective of the data collector. Kundula is a social scientist and gender expert at the IITA. She is a member of the IRB and has a long-term experience in collecting and analyzing qualitative data. The floor is yours, Kundula. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction, Celine. Um, I've been requested to talk um, about the challenges um, of data management for, from the perspective of a qualitative uh, scientist, and I will mention three challenges. The first challenge um, could be called the horse bicycle challenge, if you want to use a metaphor. Horses and bicycles are both means of transport. They may serve the same purpose of taking you from one point to another point, but the way they come into being and the way you maintain them are usually very different. So looking at qualitative and quantitative data, they are both vehicles of understanding, but they often rest on different ethical principles and on different concepts of how do we know and what do we know epistemologies. The quality of data is also assessed following different criteria. So if you judge a bicycle by the standards of a horse, you will soon see that this doesn't work out. So in the CG, we heavily lean towards quantitative approaches. We have more established ways of dealing, of managing quantitative data. And now there is this new demand for storing qualitative data. So do we want to keep the horse in the bicycle shed? Do we sufficiently identify acknowledge and consider differences, and more specifically what they mean for sharing and storing data. Well, my own experience within the CG is that the demand to upload data is clearly communicated, but there is less clarity that qualitative data cannot simply be uploaded. And there is less clarity on how to protect sensitive information. Now, the second challenge is closely related to the first one. A relationship of trust is for us very essential for getting often 
very personal information from the men and women we are working with. So we see this as a process of co-production and co-ownership. So both the researcher and the respondent produce and own, and this includes a high level of responsibility on part of the researcher to protect the respondent. So some data are less prone to being used in harmful ways, but others are highly sensitive. For instance, those about intra-household gender relations, domestic abuse, also power abuse at the community level. In order to deal with harm and confidentiality, we distinguish between raw and processed data. And the table you can see on this slide here, it shows different levels of redaction for data sharing, from no redaction to complete redaction of direct and indirect identifiers. And the table also shows that there are different levels of access to the full transcriptions or the full text. Now this table raises many questions. What level of processing is necessary to protect the respondents? What level of processing is appropriate for data sharing? And what level of processing turns my data useless for analysis for others? So here's an excerpt from a discussion at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, which I found find very interesting for, um, yeah, for data sharing and the redaction process. The cleansing of personal data, direct and indirect, remains a mammoth task for qualitative researchers, but realistically, is it even preferable to sterilize our research reports? Stripping away the personal data, particularly indirect personal data, arguably strips away the person. And anthropology is built upon writing about people, their lives, their practices, and their being. So what would be left to deposit into an archive once those details are erased? So looking at this mammoth task, what is the ratio of costs, meaning the labor we have to invest as qualitative researchers versus the benefits? I would also like to hint at possible or potential precedents within the CG that we could learn from. What can we learn, for instance, from Genovate, the largest qualitative study within CGAR that involved different entities? The third challenge relates to the conceptualization of qualitative data management. The title of this webinar is Stories from the Trenches. I would have preferred a title such as Stories of a Beginning Dialogue or Stories of Continuing Efforts. I think this webinar could be an opportunity to enter into a dialogue. Among qualitative scientists, there is the perception that data storage and sharing are top-down processes imposed on them by funding agencies, by legislation, and by others. So there have been calls for bottom-up processes. Regulations should be co-developed by those who produce qualitative data. Regulations should consider the specific characteristics and protection needs of qualitative data, and they should allow qualitative scientists to assess for themselves how sensitive specific data are, and this needs to be done on their contextual and thematic expertise. So I would be curious to hear if there are examples of this of cooperation within the CGR, CGIR, for instance, working groups with institutional econ ec economics, um, economists, sorry, working groups with uh, human geographers and other qualitative scientists where data management, the managers um, engage with them in this process of developing regulations. So for CGIR, we have set out to solve deep-seated problems, and we have understood that we need diverse teams and we need diverse sciences. 
So if we call for diversity, are we also ready for flexible and diverse concepts in terms of data processing and sharing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gondula, for your presentation. So now Florio Aguileras will tell us some story from the help desk. Florio is a research associate at the Cornell Center for the Social Sciences. He trains researchers on the use of qualitative data analysis, software packages, and serves as a consultant and lecturer on qualitative research methods, design, collection, management, tools, and analysis. The floor is yours, Florio. Uh, good morning from New York, and thanks for uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me today. Uh, today, I'll talk about the challenges of managing qualitative data from the perspective of a consultant who researchers approach on matters related to qualitative data collection, management, analysis, and tools. As a typical qualitative data analyst, after identifying the challenges, I decided to group them into two broad categories of challenges. One is on improving the quality of qualitative data, and the other is on securing qualitative data. Improving the quality of qualitative data is important because data sharing is dependent on data quality. In addition, high quality data will further enhance and deepen our analysis of the phenomenon under investigation. One way to improve the quality of data collected is the timing of data analysis. When do you start analyzing your data? I encounter some researchers who start their analysis only after they have completed their field work. This is not good practice. Analysis should be concurrent with data collection. Interweave data collection and analysis from the very start. When you do this, you can expand your notes while the interview is still fresh in your head, especially if the interview is not recorded. You have higher probability of securing a re-interview of your respondent should a follow-up interview be needed. And when you have an unexpected discovery or start seeing patterns in your data, you will be able to adjust and formulate strategies to gather additional data to better understand the phenomenon. This makes analysis exciting and fieldwork energizing. If you postpone your analysis until your return from the field, it will be a big mistake. Uh, it will be too late to fill in gaps or test new hypotheses that emerge during analysis. You can't go back to the field to investigate the themes or patterns that emerge during analysis. It will also discourage formulation of rival hypotheses that questions your assumptions. And more importantly, it makes analysis an overwhelming task that frustrates researchers and reduces the quality of work. Uh, produced. In other words, data quality would suffer. Also learn tools that would help in managing, organizing, and finding themes and patterns in your data prior to data collection. Here I listed three popular software packages, Atlas T and Vivo and MaxQDA. Why learn the software prior to collecting? Because you will be analyzing data concurrent with data collection, and these so one of these software packages uh, can help. Another way to improve quality is to provide additional information that improves the accessibility and usability of data. The list includes uh, consent, copyright, documentation, formatting, and version control, and transcription. Consent outlines how an indi individual's data will be protected and privacy maintained. It describes the purpose of the study, who will design and steer the study, the risks and benefits of participating in the study, the type of data collected, either personal, confidential, or sensitive information, how data will be used, including whether it will be shared or archived for reuse, and whether participants can review and critique interim and final products. As to copyright, establish early on who owns the copyright of your data, especially if they are, not, they are to be distributed to third parties. As to documentation, think about how you will label and organize your data and files. Are your data self-explanatory? Would someone else be able to understand your data? As to formatting and version control, which data formats will you use? Word, RTF, Excel? Will they still be available 10 years from now? If data are held in various places, how will you keep track of versions? And think about who will do the transcription. How will you ensure the confidentiality and security of your data during the transcription process? Also, have you spell checked your transcripts? One of the most important checklists that I consider a must read and a must do is the Consolidated Criteria for Reporting Qualitative Research, or CORREC. It is a 32 item checklist for explicit and comprehensive report on qualitative studies, especially those involved, involving in depth interviews and focus groups. CORREC consists of three domains. The first domain is on research team and reflexivity, where authors are required to discuss their personal characteristics and be transparent about their relationship with participants. 
The second domain is about the study design, where others are required to discuss their theoretical framework, their selection criteria, the study setting, and the data collection process. The contents of this domain and the earlier domain on reflexivity are very important for archives as they provide additional context to the study. The third domain is analysis and findings, where authors are required to discuss the data analysis and reporting process. Correct is so important that journals like those published by Elsevier require it for qualitative studies as a condition uh, for publication. So I provided the link there. Now I'll talk about the other challenge, which is securing qualitative data. How will you ensure the safety and security of your data? What are your plans for backup and how often? How will you secure personal or sensitive data? Institutional storage is always preferred as files will be readily accessible and controlled by the institutions. But the institution has to have the capacity to secure that data. Anonymizing your data is one way to secure your data. You will need to think about when this, this will be done and how. Inquire about your institutional policies for storing data with personally identifiable information or PIIs. At Cornell, our reg regular research servers do not allow storage of data with PIIs, but we have restricted access servers that allow for such data. When working as a team, Use a secure team shared space. So all files are centralized in one location to avoid proliferation of files. Data security is diminished every time a copy of a file is created and placed elsewhere. Files can easily proliferate. As shown in this table from Aldridge's article, one interview with file at the beginning ended up with at least 24 copies or versions when it is finally archived as it went through the process of distribution to team members transcription analysis, and then storage. Finally, think about preservation and access of your data. What will happen to your data once the project is completed? Will you secure all or just part of your data? Will you have different versions of your data, one for public use, the other for restricted use? Or will you destroy your data? If preserved, will your data live in an institutional repository or the cloud? Will there be legal ramifications if files are stored outside the institutions? Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Florio, for your presentation. Now, uh, Nilam and Indira will share the perspective of the data managers. Nilam Pradai is a senior data creator in IFSPRI's Communication and Public Affairs Division. She provides support for research data management and publishing data at IFPRI. She is also involved in setting up policies, protocols, and procedure for research data governance. Indira Yaramaredi is manager of knowledge management and web in IFPRI's communications and public affairs division. She has been with IFPRI since 2001 and has over 19 years of experience in strategic communications, knowledge management, and web technologies. She has taken leadership in developing institutional policies, and she has also taken a lead to form the data governance management committees to improve the research data management at IFPRI. Over to you. Thank you, Celine. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as you know, sharing qualitative data is gaining momentum in the recent years. And further, the funders mandate and publishers requirements are also calling for sharing of more data. So increased commitments to openness of data brings a lot of challenges and opportunities also. From a data manager's perspective, we will talk about some of those challenges and opportunities. IFRI is a research institution which is focused mainly in providing research-based policy solutions to sustainably reduce poverty and end hunger and malnutrition in developing countries. The research expertise in IFRI includes a bunch of economists, nutritionists, anthropologists, sociologists, and environmentalists, among so many others. So in IFRI, very often research is conducted employing quantitative methods, and very few are based on qualitative methods. So lately, mixed methods-based research is gaining momentum in IFRI, including the um, political economy-based research, governance, and gender-based research. Increasingly, we are generating more qualitative data than before. 
So data sharing plays an important role in accomplishing IFRI's mission. So in fact, IFRI and CJR mandate open access to data sets. IFRI has started uh, sharing research data since 1980, 1998. So far, we have published about 580 data sets through our institutional data repository hosted at Howard University. So out of these 580 data sets, about, I can say like 15 data sets are qualitative data sets. That is less than 3%. And it may be worth noting that none of these 15 data sets are completely open access. This clearly indicates that we are also facing challenges when it comes to sharing qualitative data. So now my colleague Neelam Prasai will discuss some of the key challenges that we are facing. Thank you, Indira. As I talk about the challenges of uh, sharing qualitative data, um, data sharing in general is often the loose ends of the research. And then in terms of the qualitative data, the details and challenges that are inherent in sharing and managing qualitative data are often not outlined during the um, contractual agreement, nor in data management plan. Further, informed consents are not collected in a way that permits data sharing. As a result, we're often not in a position to comply with funders requirement and our own institutional policy for sharing data. The second challenge is stereotyping that qualitative data cannot be reused because they are inherently contextual. In addition, there is no way of uh, controlling the interpretation, context and content of data and um, the feelings that it will be used for wrong purpose, et cetera, et cetera. However, Increasingly, evidence from ICPSR, QDR, Qualitative Data Repository, are showing the reuse of qualitative data. We agree that chances of decontextualization is there. However, it can be kept at bay by having a detailed documentation. And with proper governance structure, we can control the access and uses of qualitative data by using technology or setting up access terms and procedure, things like that. And then the third challenge that we see is often all kinds of qualitative data are treated in the same way in terms of sharing. However, we have seen the degree of variance in, in the nature and sensitivity of qualitative data. Some are very personal and sensitive while others are less so, uh, as, as Gundula has also pointed out that. For example, data from a review of policy documents are less sensitive, um, coded data from interview transcript, which is again a process data, they are also less sensitive and personal. Some can be an anonymized without losing context and content. However, we tend not to share them all together, uh, even though um, if, if we put an extra effort, those data can be shareable. And we have also seen ad hoc sharing of qualitative data, for example, over emails um, and then without using non-disclosure agreement when there are opportunities for collaboration and for general publishing, et cetera, et cetera. This presents a series of prop, uh, problems in terms of security and protection, given the rising security threats, including hacking accounts and also the file proliferation as, uh, as um, Florio mentioned in the earlier presentation. Um, and um, when researchers find opportunities, um, they tend to share data. And we also find that uh, they will find ways to eliminate the limitations posed by privacy and ethics, for example, adopting non-disclosure agreement or getting informed consent retroactively or using data enclave or trustworthy sharing platform, et cetera, et cetera. So the main limitations that we see is motivation and incentive. If we really want to reap the benefit of sharing qualitative data for secondary use and analysis, then we must find out how we want, how we can motivate and incentivize researchers for sharing qualitative data who goes above and beyond to get that data. Sharing does not happen just based on altruism. There should be some sort of um, What's in it for me? I, I, I need to see benefit for myself when I invest so much of time in documentation and sharing that data and making that data available for secondary use and analysis. And lastly, um, but not the least, we need to think about um, um, whether for, for the people like us, 
um, um, Boshun, Indira, and myself, um, are we ready to provide the support that our researchers need in terms of sharing qualitative data? Do we have uh, resources and in infrastructure for sharing qualitative data? Uh, do we have uh, capacity to go over thousands of lines of interview text to see whether, th whether the data content, any identifiable information? Um, do we have the ability to ensure that the qualitative data is anony anonymized? Are we trained for this? And um, the way that I see as of now is the answer is no. So how do we provide the support to our researchers when they need th that kind of, self, um, of support and when our, our policy requires data sharing? These are challenges in terms of sharing the the um, qualitative data and overall kind of data, but they also present opportunities. Um, pushing towards sharing of uh, qualitative data will advance governance procedures, protocols, and infrastructure, thereby enabling the research integrity and and transparency. Despite the fact, in many cases, that um, good uh, uh, good research data management is, is is a research process in itself, but we have seen again and again that uh, our researchers consider um, uh, doing a research ma data management is is an additional work. D writing a data management plan is an additional work. However, if we enforce this kind of uh, sharing data and then the better research data management, then it will improve the overall procedure of the quality of data as well as documentation thereby it enables the the reuse um, both for external and also for self reuse by having the nice documentation and this also lead us um, to foster new collaboration and scientific impact through uh, reuse and analysis with the less use of resources and it, it also help us to be economically more responsible and the last thing that I want to talk about is the long term preservation. <clears throat> the data has not uh, the qualitative data, given the nature and the and the sensitivity, it doesn't has to be uh, it doesn't have to be open access 100% open access, we can adopt the range of uh, um, a variety of um, uh, access label for sharing qualitative data. And then if we find a way for um, uh, preserving the data for, uh, for, for the long term, um, especially in cases where data cannot be shared at all because of their sensitivity, ethics, or, or, or privacy matter. But then we also need to keep some in our mind that privacy and ethics uh, um, will become irrelevant uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for all data sets uh, after 40 years or 30 years because people move on or people die, th things for that reason. But then the qualitative data because of the difficulty in collection, because of its personal nature, these data are highly valuable and we must not lose the value of uh, qualitative data. So we must find a way for its long-term preservation and security will be of prime importance. But then as technology has solved many of our problem, then probably we'll be able to solve the problem of uh, security and probably use the better way, um, uh, the technology that we have in our hand in better ways. So we must uh, not lose our highly valuable, um, the treasured uh, qualitative data, which will provide an opportunity for comparing our past versus present um, and the, the historical nature of data. So we must keep talking about how we can preserve this data for long term use and also think about the security and how we can move forward. We need to have this kind of discussion. Um, again and again, and um, as Gundula said that it is just the beginning and will we'll evolve as we keep on discussing about the difficulty and challenges that is associated with the sharing of qualitative data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nilam and Indira for your presentation. Thank you all for giving this great panorama of the challenges faced by qualitative data users. Now I will hand it over to Boston to facilitate the, the panel discussion. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been interesting listening to the perspective from the data creator to those that are in charge of the tools and the data managers. Gundula, we have actually discussed some of the challenges that's peculiar to data qualitative data. I just see others. For instance, 
there may be country specific or regional regulations that we may need to negotiate apart from the continuous engagement of data managers with data creators. Do you still have others that you feel we need to understand that will help everybody listening to this? I think this is a, this is a very interesting um, question if they are country specific or, or regional specific um, regulations. Um, but the only um, regulation, regional specific regulation that I know of really is um, the new one by the EU, um, which was um, um, which started in 2016, and the countries were given a, a period of two years to implement it, and has been um, uh, received very mixed feelings by qualitative researchers in Europe. So that is the only one that I know of. But I think it could have uh, uh, implications for us as well, because we're also dealing with European donors. And um, maybe the other data managers could talk more about that if they can already foresee what this means for, for different organizations that we have this new um, data protection regulation from, uh, from the EU, from the European Union. Thank you much, Gundula, for that exposure to us about the GDPR. And I think our colleagues in the US Council gave us some perspective because we also have donors that fund us, USAID, BMGF, and many more, they are also based in the US. Do you have anyone peculiar to the North America, the South America, Asia, Africa? Uh, I would like Indira to give us a perspective from for this. So, um, so uh, thank you, Bosan. So you're talking about the EU general protection regulations uh, in terms of uh, sharing qualitative data besides EU, the other countries? Yes. Okay. So basically the CGR basically work in developing countries and the EU GDPR for research data may not be a serious concern for CGR research on any human subjects in developing countries, basically. So, however, uh, many countries are coming with similar regulations, like which basically requires to identify retention period of any personal data. If you take, this will basically require personal data minimization, data be uh, kept for specific years. In such cases, uh, uh, ensuring data destruction will be the key to share uh, any data that are not de-identified. So we should make sure like uh, we should use the non-disclosure agreements. And uh, as in the presentations, like we also mentioned, like while you are sharing the data email through email, make sure like you have to use the NDA, not share any uh, data with sensitive information through emails. Make sure always use the non-disclosure thank you so much indira for that perspective especially for the emerging economies the developing countries also florio you have a vast experience when it comes to managing qualitative data with cornell and you have been i mean working with researchers across different fields how can we increase data security for qualitative data? And I won't want it to just restrict it to security only. I also want to look at how do we make this data after securing it reusable? So Gundula has already uh, mentioned about uh, anonymization as one of the main uh, things that we have to do uh, in order to secure uh, data and uh, it can be uh, a mammoth task depending on the quality, on uh, the type of data that you've collected, and it can be really mammoth at, 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 in sometimes. The other thing uh, would be uh, working in a secure uh, environment, and that's what uh, we typically our researchers here at Cornell uh, do. Um, some data that are uh, with personally identifiable information are actually 
being processed in a restricted access uh, data center rather than in an ordinary or regular research server. At the same time, uh, if there are qualitative data that aren't, that do not have uh, personally identifiable information, uh, we have a, a, a research server dedicated for that. And we can provide a team, a shared space uh, for that project team where only the members of that team will have access to that research server. All the files are centrally located uh, in that particular uh, shared space. They work in that shared space. It has all kinds of uh, qualitative data analysis software packages, well, not all types, but at least there are Atlas DI and in vivo there that they can use. And eventually we will be adding Max QDA. Uh, so our researchers will be able to, to use those statistical packages to process uh, their qualitative data. At the same time, uh, it has uh, other statistical software packages in, in case they need uh, quantitative uh, software packages like SPSS, SAS, Data, R, Mathematica, MATLAB, and so on. So we provide, um, one can provide if you have the budget to, uh, for a server that will have that uh, capacity uh, to uh, provide a shared space for the project team so that everything is look, uh, centrally located. At the same time, it minimizes the possibility of proliferating multiple copies of the file. Uh, that's one of the main issues actually of uh, uh, data security. And that is you know, you have multiple versions and copies of the files in various locations, one in a person's laptop, uh, one in a, uh, in a personal uh, uh, home computer, uh, one in a research server, and so on. There can be multiple versions of that file. Um, so uh, that's all I can think of at, at the moment in terms of uh, securing that uh, uh, those uh, that data. Um, Thanks so much, yeah, Florio. Uh, yeah. Boston, can I add yeah. some more things to that? Please go ahead, Indira. Oh. Thank you. So adding to some of the things to Florio is uh, like in IFRI, we always tell researchers to encrypt data and uh, their computers and internet connections and ensure there is an antivirus software. That is also important. And also we make sure uh, to set up secure servers for files transfers and backup as Florio mentioned. And the other thing is always use encryption while sharing PII in email communications. That is also in, we always tell researchers because they share a lot of uh, uh, files through email. So always make sure to, encryption is the main important thing. And also as everybody knows, like ensure to use a strong password and change it regularly. That is also important. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the access to the um, archived sensitive data, must be restricted and limited to only those that require that require it. That is also one thing. And the last important thing is like uh, conduct regular access reviews and individuals no longer requiring access to the data should be removed. They should be removed. That is also important. Mm. Thank you, Indira, for that insight. You know, to what you just said, I could flash back in my back life that we in the financial environment, when you want to deal with highly classified data, you take it offline. Because the belief is that even if with the highest firewall, that network can still be hacked. Mm -hmm. So to prevent it for quality data, maybe we, we also need to be thinking about creating, like what Flori mentioned that's being done in Cornell, Apart from all these antivirus, firewall, we begin to create a separate environment that are qualitative research that you within one CG may need to use. Apart from other factors that we need to be considered, it's just a thought. Now that will lead me to what you told us, Nelan, that we need to see, continue to engage. And Gundula, you also mentioned it, but I want from the perspective of a data manager, Neelam, can you tell us have data manager within CGIAR 
been engaging qualitative researchers, either directly or indirectly on a continuous basis. For instance, by building committees or working groups. If we have been doing that, what are the experiences that is being shared across CG? And if we have not, what do you think from your experience that we can do? Um, uh, thank you, Basun. Uh, um, this is the uh, <laughs> this is the uh, very good question, and I wish uh, I have a good answer um, and a very optimistic answer, but I don't. The thing is, um, 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 as we started the uh, momentum of sharing data, we started thinking mostly on quality on quantitative data, not so much on, on um, qualitative data, um, because um, I, I, I personally feel that we're afraid of dealing with qualitative data because of so many challenges associated with it, right? But then this is a good start. Um, um, and, um, I'm, and I'm very pleased to be a part of this discussion. Um, we, um, I, the way that I understand and I see it, people within each center in CGIR are, are having discussions around managing qualitative data within their own niche and corner. But as a CGIR overall, we still need to get organized and bring more of a diverse uh, people, including researchers, different kind, with, even within researchers, even quantitative and qualitative uh, legal and uh, data managers like us to have a discussion about the options for sharing qualitative data. I would like to emphasize that it does not have to be open, but what we need to have is, um, if we cannot de-identify data, then at least there should be some place to access the data in a secure way, in a trustworthy environment. And as Florio mentioned that we need to limit the file proliferation. I see that as a huge problem within the context of CGIR, because most of the downloads and sharing happens over um, email, either in the zip format, or in Dropbox or OneDrive, this will ultimately lead to the file proliferation and it will be out of control. Even though we are using the NDA and the things like that, but still it is a huge problem. So for CGIR overall, we need to come up as a group, the, the group of uh, diverse people, including researchers, and come up with the um, um, guidelines that are specific for uh, for qualitative data management. What are the things that researchers need for sharing and managing qualitative data? Uh, we are slightly behind in terms of pro providing our researchers that level of support as compared to quantitative data, and we need to get in board with our researchers. Thank you very much, Neela. Now, the repository working group definitely is going to take this up now. You are leading that? Definitely, definitely. Um, this is the start, uh, Bushun. I think repository working group and IDMCOP overall will start having this discussion. And data is um, within the vision of one CGIR also. And as we have been hearing from Meda and all, data is taking a prominent place as we are trying to organize ourselves. So definitely we need to think about it. And we all of us need to bring it to the center of the discussion both. And thank you for basically taking the lead for organizing this webinar. Thank you to you all. So welcome. Gundula, you are a data creator. You have the first hand experience and you know the pain of gathering this data. You work with gender data, you work with different forms of qualitative data. What advice can you give to data managers, data preservers within one CG to ensure that we work collaboratively with data creators? Yeah, I'm very happy for the positive response uh, by Neelam and uh, also by Bosun. Um, as I have outlined in, in my presentation, there is very often the impression by researchers that this is done, but they just feel the regulations later on. And I think it's a, it will greatly improve the acceptability of these processes 
if um, the um, researchers are involved and um, also can uh, um, express their concerns. So I think that is the first step really to say, we want to do this um, with many stakeholders together um, so that this uh, is actually successful. And I think the success of such a process um, rests um, um, in a tremendous manner on the involvement of all people who are somehow in this chain of data production and um, uh, data management later on after production. So this is, I think, the first um, advice. And the second advice is as well to think about flexibility, because um, qualitative data production um, takes place in many countries across the CGIR in many contexts. Um, and there is maybe um, a tendency to think of uh, some kind of standardization and of, uh, of strict requirements. And I think there is a need to be uh, flexible in order to ensure the protection of respondents and also to ensure other important issues. So some kind of overly bureaucratic regulation could be completely counterproductive for what we are trying to achieve. So I think it's important to think about flexibility as well. Thank you. Thank you, Gundula. That is a great insight. And I believe for data managers here, they're taking something home. Now on a bigger perspective, data reuse. Flory, I'm going to ask you to help us with this question. Oh, wait, can I just add uh, one thing? Uh, okay, go ahead. About... Okay, so uh, one other thing that uh, is very important actually in terms of uh, the important is a communication between uh, the data managers and actually the other uh, researchers. Um, when it comes to managing qualitative data or any data in general, um, discussions should start at the conceptualization stage. So data managers and uh, uh, researchers should be talking about uh, data management at that stage. Um, the, the data manager should at least uh, provide information, provide uh, information about what they need from researchers at the outset so that that will be uh, provided to them along the way. Yeah, just to add on what Florio um, mentioned, I mean, we are learning over as we evolve with all this kind of data sharing momentum and open access and things like that. We also need to emphasize the fact that all data cannot be shared, right? So there are, uh, and especially with the qualitative data, there are ethical challenges, privacy challenges. And then many countries are coming up with the GDPR kind, kind of stricter regulations. By far, GDPR is the most strict, strictest regulation of all um, in terms of data sharing. But then many countries are basically following the developing countries like uh, uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, they are, and, and India is also coming up with similar kind of bill. So if we start thinking about the legislations that offer, uh, that basically um, limits the ability of sharing data, managing data, then we need to think about it during the research design process itself. We, uh, we, need, we basically tend to think less of legal and uh, um, other kind of regulations um, as we design during the um, as we design our research, and it should be at the forefront because um, our experience with uh, our recent experience with Tanzania um, um, has been kind of a difficult one. There are some kind of exceptions, mostly for research processes, but then it has to be done in advance. Um, um, and many countries are basically uh, prohibiting the cross-country transfer of data. So we may not be able to uh, bring data to, to the place where we work anymore. It has to, everything has to be done within the same country. That is another thing that we need to concern, we need to think about during the 
research process itself. So research design, ha research uh, has to be designed in a way, uh, as Floria mentioned, that uh, uh, that basically considers all these aspects. And uh, as uh, as um, um, uh, Gondula mentioned, that we need to be flexible. Not all data are publicly shareable, mm -hmm. and it may not be worth to share data. But we need to do our best to share the data that are, are shareable or shared in a limited way. Um, giving limited access, limited use data, but people should be able to use if they want to use and come up with new sort of innovations or new sort of engagement or collaboration. Um, um, we need to use data in an exhaustive way as much as we can. So adding to the Neelam's point, okay. so yes, all data cannot be shareable. So at least we can share the metadata and restrict the access to the files in the data repository. So when there is a request from other researchers to do further analysis, and then we can use the non-disclosure agreement to share the data with the requesters. So that way we, we know like there is a research done on that particular topic, and then we have the metadata. If you have a metadata and who, who to collaborate and who to request for that, it is useful in the long run. Otherwise, the data is useless because we are yes. putting a lot of effort in collecting the data and doing a lot of analysis. Why don't it would be useful for others to do further analysis? And in long run, even for the same researchers also, they don't need to start head start again from the beginning. Already, if you have data, we can use the data and do further research. Thank you, Hindira. Yeah, I agree with your responses. and. Uh, before I go too far, please send in your question. You can put it on the Q and A, or if you if you can't do that, put it on the chat. It will be responded to. I can promise you, C line will be handling that shortly. I have this last question for Florio. Based on your experience, we want to really tap from you. Mm. Let me quote this from Walter. Walter in two thousand and nine says that data will lose value without the knowledge and expertise of the researchers who designed and implemented the original research project and prepare and analyze it. How can we address this concern in CGIAR? Knowing fully well that when you anonymize some data, they may not be useful. And even the scientists that wish to reuse it may not get the exact mind of the initial or the original data creator. What advice can you give us? Or what is the best approach that we can adopt, which you have been using or planning to use okay. at Corner? One of, one of the key words that uh, was uh, mentioned by Indira is the metadata it's very important that you collect the metadata for that particular study. Uh, at the same time, uh, collect all possible files that are related to the project. Uh, for example, the IRB proposal, the, uh, the grant proposal, the informed consent, the, uh, the guide questionnaires, uh, questionnaires, the semi-structured questionnaires, um, and also any study that was uh, that was published related to the particular study. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, as a condition for publication, some journals require that uh, core that consolidated criteria for uh, qualitative research or the core or the core requirements for reporting qualitative research. These are thirty-two items that actually the archive can use to provide context to the project itself. I think the, the, the observation by Walters is, is very valid. And one of the options out of this would be that those who are interested in reuse would form some kind of a collaboration with those people who have produced um, the data at the very beginning. So this could be uh, an option to explore 
if, and that would also provide an incentive as Nilam has uh, presented as well. That would be an incentive to share data if um, your own investment would be credited as well in the sense that you are then um, a co-author or um, a, a, a collaborator in a new project or something like that. So I think that is something that, that, that really should be explored more as um, a possible way of, of sharing data and also of making um, reuse meaningful. Thank you, Gudula. Thank you, everyone on the panel list. Florio, Indira, Nilam. I think you have opened our eyes and it's cool we are hearing this from the professionals. But we still have more questions. So I'm going to hand over to Celine. Thank you very much, Boso, and thank you all for this great discussion. We'll now open up the floor for the audience to take part of these discussions. Olayemi, you have a question. Uh, this is Olayemi from IIT Ibadan, Nigeria. My question is this, how can the authenticity of qualitative data, especially text data, be preserved, especially when transcription and or translation is involved? Maybe a, a short answer. Um, we do not always conduct our interviews in English or French. Um, many of us are also conducting interviews in local languages. So I always insist on a transcription in uh, Swahili for my work in Tanzania. So that the text, uh, that I can read the text in the original language. And we do the same, for instance, in Malawi as well for Chichewa. We in part also have bilingual trans, uh, transcriptions where you can see what was said in the original and how this was translated into English. So there are efforts to, to do that for, for certain languages in order to get a closer feel of um, um, what was said in, in the original language, for instance. I don't know if this um, answers your question. Yeah, adding to that, um, so even sometimes researchers, when they do questionnaires in English, if suppose, for example, if you take the Bangladesh country, right? We ask researchers to have the Bangla questionnaire also, which is useful for the people who doesn't read English. So they can have the local language. So if researchers can do the questionnaires, at least questionnaires in different languages, that would be useful. And then um, back, uh, I think, I believe uh, what Gundola mentioned was about back translation, tran where the interview will be translated into English and then uh, that English translation will be back translated to the original language. Uh, and the other thing is uh, uh, to preserve it would be, uh, the authenticity of it would be, if you can keep the recording, that will be, uh, and you can archive it, that would be uh, uh, one that would be uh, important as well. For the next question, I will give the floor to Marie Angelic. Thank you for the presentations and, and the discussion. That was very interesting. So my question is uh, then based on all of you, um, what you said, I mean, uh, should like the CGAR invest in some sort of a security platform for research on sensitive data? like? also qualitative data, where maybe researchers, when they want to conduct some sort of, uh, you know, research, um, they should then uh, sign like, I mean, not the primary maybe producer of data, but when someone wants to reuse the data, where they should sign like, like uh, you know, some data agreements and then get their request validated by some ethic, uh, ethics um, committee or, 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 or and, and then yeah have access to this um, security platform and then perform their analysis there on the data that they were granted access um, uh, to and, and of course on this secure platform I mean the data sh don't have to be um, the whole data I mean they can still be I think um, in some sort they, uh, they identify yeah, they, they could be yeah anonymized in, in, in some way, but but yeah, should the CGAR uh, should invest in, in such a system to facilitate like the research on qualitative data? Let me give my insight into data and cloud. One of the most secure infrastructures in the world is the US platform, DOF, but they have been hacked before. 
like a scientist once joked, he said, if it's in the cloud, then thunder can strike it. Invariably, what I'm saying is that for qualitative data, as long as it's on the internet, yes, we can build in some level of security around it, invest so much in it, and we put in controls like authentication, that is signing in with user ID, it can be multi-factor authentication to know who is accessing what, what, and then you mentioned about having like a committee that legislate on who can access particular data because of reuse to ensure that we maintain the integrity and the interoperability of the data. I think it's a good thing for us when it comes to quantitative data. But I am thinking because we are widely dispersed across different continents, I don't know how much they're going to spend to have a well secure platform that will ensure that PII, personally identifiable information, are not exposed. The vulnerable, we're talking about gender data, they're not exposed. Well, if we can get the experts that will come in that will say that these data are safe in this, maybe Amazon, Azure, or I don't know what we call it, it may be a good thing. And that can ensure that the reuse of data Anonymization, controlling access to it, we can maintain it. Anonymization in the sense that if you see that this particular data in this section of the cloud has been anonymized, but, but the original data is in another subdirectory within that infrastructure, which can only be gained access to after certain permission has been given and you have this specific token to access it, that is good to give us good preservation system within one CG. But like I say, I said earlier, we need to take care of that guy that is watching and we are not watching the person. So how would that be taken care of? I don't know. But if you ask me, it is always a good option. Like I mentioned what was done in my past world, past life, that anything that is we know is extremely sensitive we put it offline. So offline, you can have you can have local area network in which people within that environment can access. Or VPN is created where those within the local area network or wide area network or metropolitan area network can access. So if CG is looking at creating such an environment in which you can then have tools, we can have, I mean, all the tools that Flora is using to analyze his data. Gundula also mentioned some of them too. We can have in that environment, just like what we are doing, we are planning to do on CG lab, but has to be offline, not in the cloud in which everybody can just dump in, log in and just go out. I think it may be a thing to look into. That's my own thinking about this. Yeah, adding to that, Boson, like, yes, uh, that's a good question, Mary. Right now in IFRI, we are using the Dropbox uh, for share, for uh, keeping the PIA information data, and the IT has given different level of access. So the PIA has uh, one level of access, and then the people working on that has different access. And when it comes to data managers, we have different access to view the files. That is what we are doing right now. And uh, at the CG level, definitely it is important to look into a one platform, but uh, I don't know how feasible it is right now, but it is important. Um, and also when we are giving, because right now we are only talking about one centers. When you combine all centers, we have to take more care when we are giving access to the data. That is one thing. And the other thing is in IFRI, the IT has also has multi-factor authentication. Right now we have a secure kind of thing, the multi-factor authentications. We cannot, once you approve only, we can go and look into the files and folders. That is also very good. Obviously uh, sharing de-identified data is the best way to go, right? But then 
uh, when we de-identify data, we lose the meaning of data in some context. So for those kind of data, uh, I think it is already high time to invest um, in that kind of uh, sophisticated technology for CGIR. Um, forget about qualitative data, we are not even sharing in many cases. So for example, in every cases, we are probably sharing only about 2% of data, right? Um, but uh, we are sharing, um, uh, there is a huge demand for geospatial data sets. And then what I see overall the problem in CGIR is file proliferation. Once file goes out of uh, one, um, in multiple places, then it is difficult to control. We don't know who does what and who will get access to that file. Just to limit that also, we need to limit our ability to download files, the sensitive, uh, the files containing sensitive data. For that reason also, we need to invest in some sort of uh, computing structure, infrastructure, where, you know, like uh, as Marie said that people need uh, can go in either in the form of PPN or whatever the technology behind it is. They do some kind of NDA and then they use the data, get the result that they want, and then they go out only with the result, not with the data file. It's already high time to do that, even for geospatial data, because which has been um, uh, Based on our own experience, um, we get a huge demand of uh, geospatial coordinates at household and farm level. And uh, sometimes we find ourselves um, in this delicate intricacy between the sensitive nature of data, data versus the use that uh, people can do and how do we share. And then um, as we are limited with the technology, as Indira mentioned, we mostly share those kind of data using the Dropbox and NDA, but then another person already has access to that data. And then the problem of file proliferation is huge. It's huge. We need to think about it very seriously. And um, uh, Marie, I, um, Angelic, I already see that it's high time. We have, we need to invest in that kind of structure when it comes to sharing data uh, for research purpose using NDA. Um, 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 uh, we can forget about the sensitive nature of data just for sharing some minimal data uh, for advanced research. We need to have that kind of structure and having, a, um, uh, I see the problem that Boston pointed out once you are online, then um, um, uh, probably there is no way to getting back and you, you can be hacked and things like that. But then I see that um, even the, um, as he also mentioned that uh, Department of Defense has that kind of structure and that is also got, that also got hacked and things like that. But then when we challenge the technology then something new will come, right? It's, that doesn't mean that we go retroactive and then just believe on offline sharing or um, local sharing or have some kind of data in uh, enclave like a structure on site only. Um, I think we need to be more into looking into the solution in a, in a, in a decentralized way because having things at one place will also you know, limit our ability to use that data. And if you are trying to have more people to use that data, then we have to make it in a way that it is uh, accessible for many, but in a safe and secure way. And I. I do think that investing in that kind of structure will help CGIR to go forward and we need that kind of structure. But then the key question should be, how do we make that structure secure? How can we do that? That's where we need to look into, uh, into rather than not having the system um, um, in one place or not having the system developed at all, but we need to find ways, how do we make that system um, secure and uh, um, make it workable for everyone? Do you allow me to just say one minute just before, um, I, I, I raised this concern some months back at IITA and I developed a model based on my experience on infrastructure. I came up with what I developed for one of the major telecoms in this country, Nigeria. I developed that model. That model is that you have an offline server, which access will be created through VPN or Think Client. Think Client is like having an app on your computer. When you click on that app, it will take you to where the server is. So without that app, you cannot access the server. 
And even when you have the app, you have to supply your level of authentication. It asks for some credentials, not one, like two or three, then you access it. So with that, it may be possible for us to be able to gather our data. Florian has advised us that we start analyzing immediately and continuously. When you have the data there, even inside this secure and offline infrastructure, we have levels of security. For data that are ready for final preservation and quote and unquote sharing, some data will not be made open at all. Some will be anonymized and then be exposed, but it will be useless to anyone that wants to reuse it until when you have contacted the data owner or a particular committee set up like guardian, like a guardian of the infrastructure qualitative data that will give you permission, then give you authorization to access through the secure thing client. Remember I said think like it's like an app that you can move it securely to access the offline server. So if that is in place, it may give us some level of security. And then the design that I did was that on our CCAN, which is exposed to Guardian, the metadata are available. You click on it, you see the DOI, that is the handle, the permanent identifier to the data but you can't access the data. To access it, you'll be shown an email which you need to contact. So that email, you start engaging the data owner or the body responsible for managing data. So it gives us some level of security. It gives the data creator some level of confidence that the data that he or she is sharing with us is well preserved, it's secure, it's not exposed. And at the same time, the respondent, those that responded to the interviews, they are well protected also. We are taking care of many concerns. If we may look at that model, we can still get more people that are exposed in IT to look at it. Maybe it's what we can look at. Mary Angelic has given us a good insight, but I think it's what we can look into and see if we can merge all the model together and get something functional, customizable for one CG. Wow, this was a, a right question <laughs> that raised a lot of uh, answers. And so we have another question from Peter Stewart from ECRAF. He has left, but I will ask his question. So data protection laws often require data to be used for a specific purpose, then to be deleted when this purpose has been met. So this is what he, you say, Nilam. CGIR has been rather lax in terms of ethical review and data protection in the past. So we have historical data sets where we did not specifically ask for the permission to retain data for other use. So we need do we need to delete this data to be in line with the UE GDPR rules? Um, so example, we have historical issue with informed consent. Um, um, within the context of GDPR, and if we start addressing questions within the um, uh, within the paradigm of GDPR, I think we'll get answers to many of our uh, data security and do's and don'ts kind of questions, right? Um, so uh, GDPR is quite flexible in terms of research. I think it would be the informed consent would be more of an ethical challenge where which requires us basically do no harm and then use the information only for the purpose that we receive the consent, right? Technically, yes, we are basically, if we, if we did not get the consent to use the data for the purpose that we did not um, ask consent, we should be deleting the data, right? Uh, basically the identifiable data, that should be what we are doing. But my experience is we haven't done that. Um, the, even the primary researchers who collected the data, they will keep that data and use it for their own secondary purpose. And I also personally, I also think that we should not delete the, that valuable data, um, but then we also find ways on how do we collect data which allow us to use um, for a purpose than what we collected it for, 
right? So we probably need to be more careful about uh, designing our informed consent in a way that it allow us to use data in a way uh, for a purpose that what we receive consent for, that should be one. The second should be, um, the, uh, the second obvious answer is there is no restrictions for using de-identified data and for qualitative data, that is something difficult to, to achieve. And then third is, uh, Meda brought um, it, uh, the, the discussion of uh, dynamic consent. So, but then this will probably require more of a technical savviness from the part of uh, the data provider as well. And given the fact that we are actually working on in the environment of, uh, of uh, many developing countries which are technologically limited and um, uh, with the understanding of uh, using technology. Um, um, so um, um, uh, dynamic consent would be another way to adapt ourselves to use um, the research and data for the purpose than what it is uh, um, actually originally intended for but then at the same time it give, it, it, it provides us a way but then we also need to think about the biasness um, inherent in terms of data collection um, from the perspective of the people that will be only reaching out to pay uh, out uh, who are technologically savvy who have access to technology these kind of the things are basically limited um, ethics wise uh, for the data that has been already collected and um, 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 ethics wise, technically, we are actually supposed to delete the data after um, uh, three years, minimum of three years, um, 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 based on IRB. Um, um, that is the retention period for data that uh, we collected from the field. We should be able to provide the evidence of our research. We need to hold that for three years. And after that, um, uh, and or more, depending upon the agreement that you have in place, right? After that, we should be deleting the data. But I have seen less in terms of practice. So how do we ensure that we are destroying the data? We have uh, five more minutes and, and no more questions for the audience. So I will give the, the floor to, to both soon to raise the last uh, command question. Florio, you've given us an insight to what we can do. And Kundula is here representing our primary data creator, even the secondary reuser in terms of data analytics. We don't just want to be collecting data. We want this data to be reusable in the future. And if possible, follow the fair principle interoperability, accessibility, findability, and reusability. You've mentioned some tools. Will it be possible for us to have like an infrastructure which our researchers spread across the globe can put in the data centrally and work securely? Will it be a feasible thing? And if it is feasible, how do you yes, think we can is, go about it, is, it? It is feasible and we are doing it now uh, here at Cornell. So we have, a, you, we, you can have actually two types of servers uh, for this. One would be a restricted server, restricted access data server where your data have PIIs and the other ones where you have, uh, it's a regular server where the data that lives there are those that have been anonymized. Okay, so you have two types of versions. For the restricted access uh, data center, uh, it will be a dual factor authentication um, and with VPN uh, as well. So VPN plus dual factor authentication in order to get access to, to the server that, can, that has your data. Uh, and that server all, has all the tools that you would need to do your analysis. So everything will be done within that server. So it has uh, Atlas TI and Vivo, Max QDA, SPSS, SAS data, all kinds of uh, software packages that will that potentially your researchers will uh, will use uh, in their analysis. Um, that server will also have a, 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 a has a has a dedicated space for the members of a team. Okay, there will be a specific folder for each project team and only members of that project team will have access to that server. It's possible that you can set that server up in such a way that because it's restricted access that it won't have any uh, internet connection, no, no browsers. Uh, basically, it's just a space to process 
uh, and analyze data. Okay. And then on a regular server, so this is a, the other type of server, uh, it can have uh, access to the internet. Um, but it's not as, uh, as, in other words, it's not as strict as the, uh, the, the restricted access data server. It doesn't have to uh, require uh, dual factor authentication. Um, but still the same, there will be a, a shared space for, uh, for project teams. Each project team will have, the, each project will have their own folders. And then only members of that project will have, and this is all remote, uh, remote uh, this is, uh, these are all accessible by a remote desktop uh, connection. So for anywhere in the world, researchers can log in for as long as they have internet uh, connection. And then each member will have their own account. They can only go into specific uh, uh, folders within uh, given, their, given their, their account. So there'll be different access levels depending on their account. Uh, there will be uh, the types of access. Uh, for example, in our restricted access, the data center, some researchers can upload and download files. Others cannot. So there's are, there are things that can be set. Okay, there, there, there are uh, settings, security settings that are your IT uh, personnel can set in order uh, to give access to, uh, uh, to the server. Great, thank you very much, uh, Florio, for this answer. As Gondula and Nilam said, this is just the beginning of the discussion. We'll continue to talk about this topic, I think within the IDM Corp and the different uh, working groups. I really thank you all for taking the time to prepare uh, your presentation, the panel discussion, and take the, the question from the audience. If you wish to be part of the discussion, you can reach uh, Meda, Bosun, or myself. Thank you all again. Thank you, Celine and Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.